my name is Katie Churchwell. I am an education and volunteer specialist with the Wenatchee Valley Museum. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Wenatchee Valley Museum and Cultural Center is located on the traditional homelands of the Pascosa or Wenatchee people. We acknowledge the traditional lands and offer respect and gratitude to the Pascosa and to the diverse indigenous peoples that reside in North Central Washington today. Welcome to our environmental film series. The purpose of this series is to bring to light in the community conservation and environmental issues and tie them into our valley. Our sponsor tonight is the North Central Washington Audubon Society. The NCWAS is dedicated to furthering the knowledge and the conservation of the environment of North Central Washington, our nation and the world. And furthering that mission tonight, we have Mark Oswood, Mary Roy and Bruce McCann, Nick Cannon, who I will now let introduce themselves. So I'm Mark Oswood, uh, the salient part of my life history, the second and third larval instars is that um, I was a biology professor for 20 some years at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, but nothing exceptionally useful for tonight. Stream ecologist, aquatic entomologist. And I'm Mary Roy and I've been a teacher. I've been retired for about nine years. I've taught in Baltimore, in Wenatchee, and um, last in Arondo for the last 20 years. And bringing up the rear is Bruce McCammon. I'm a retired forest hydrologist. I worked for the US Forest Service for 37 years and found my way out to Wenatchee. I uh, retired 15 years ago and have been in Wenatchee for the last six. So here I am. Here you are. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. Um, tonight we're discussing the film Anthropocene, uh, a term I hadn't heard before this documentary. The Anthropocene refers to the concept that we are now in a new epoch or a geographical age marked by the scale of human influence on various processes of the earth. Um, so I have a few questions prepared for our panel. Um, the first one being, how do the themes brought up in Anthropocene relate to the work NCWAS is doing with birds or with birds in general? And you, you want to answer? <laughs> Um, I, can, I think maybe we'll save that for at, at the end. So maybe I was going to do a little intro here. Oh, and then, sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, okay. Ahead. And then, then the three of us were going to go through and do these mercifully brief little little 10-minute doodahs uh, for our responses to the film and to the whole concept. And But that would be a good thing for at the end of all that to come back to. Okay, so that sounds good to do me. it then? So for, for an intro here, um, you've already done half my work for me. It, we, uh, North Central Washington Audubon has been doing these environmental film series since the la very last of the woolly mammoths were still around in the area of Wenatchee. I got to tell you, it's a lot more fun to do this in the auditorium with everybody sitting in chairs live. We could watch, we could have watched the film together. Mm -hmm. We could have had comments afterwards and we traditionally, everybody in the audience who has been well behaved gets cookies and juice at the end. That's always fun too, but we don't get to do that this year. So uh, for whoever's watching this in Zoom now or in the hereafter, um, thank you for, for doing one more Zoom webinar. And Katie has done half uh, a good part of my job for me. The, the film that you should all have seen by now uh, Anthropocene or Anthropocene, depending on apparently what part of the world you're from, um, is a term that has two almost separate meanings, almost separate uses. And the first one is, again, Katie mentioned this just in passing, and probably the first one is the less useful, and that is it's a technical term in the, the geological time scale, and it refers to the the idea that we might be adding on a whole new geological epoch on top of the Holocene, and it would start up somewhere in, in the vicinity of us, in the vicinity of humans. And this whole, the whole notion of this, the geological timescale is a very formalized one. It gets a lot of votes, big long committees, 
And the proposition is that there would be this new Anthropocene. And the sticking point has been in part that the, the geological time scale is both slices of time going back starting four and a half billion years ago at the beginning of, of, of the earth. And there are these slices in time and there are also corresponding slices in the sediments in the rocks of the earth. And there are the, all these named parts of the geological time scale and these, these time named time periods start with an equivalent spot in a rock layer where, where a, a whole new geological period starts. And usually that's where there's a whole bunch of new kinds of fossils occur. Something big has happened on the planet Earth. Lots of fossils, lots of organisms have died. They disappear. Some new organisms have arisen. They appear in the fossil record. And right there is where you put what's called a golden spike. And there's, there's usually not actually a golden spike, but there's a marker in the sediments. And you say, that's where this geological period begins. So a part of the controversy for the Anthropocene or Anthropocene has been what golden spike would we use for the start of the Anthropocene? And there have been all sorts of suggestions, but that seems to be near as I can read. That seems to be coming, that, that debate seems to be coming to a close. And the answer seems to be 1950, and which is a marker for a couple of things. One is just a whole lot of human effects on the planet Earth just suddenly erupting and, and increasing. And then secondly, what the real marker is, is it's the onset of nuclear testing. And so in the, in the sedimentary record, you can actually find the radioactive materials. And that's important because these things have to be something that geologists of the far distant future can actually find. So a million years from now, uh, a, a geologist that probably will be a sentient rat by that time would need to be able to find this layer that would be the start of the Anthropocene, this radioactive layer. So, but the second big um, meaning of the word Anthropocene really is just an overall recognition of the incredible effects that humans have, have had and are having on the planet Earth. And I've got here some, um, some examples that will just blow your socks off. And you know, even on a Zoom, even on a Zoom meeting here. So, in the last 60 years or so, if you look at the curves for the population size of human po humans on Earth, if you look at extinction rates, if you look at acidification of the oceans, if you look at movements of organisms, if you look at resource extraction, and you just plot that along on time, about 60 years ago, all of those curves are just trundling along, and all suddenly they go brum, up, and they all increase, not quite in synchrony, but really close to in synchrony. And this whole, all these things happening at once is referred to as the great acceleration. And there are some numbers that emerge from that that are just astounding. One of them is that uh, populations, the numbers of individuals of vertebrates, all the fishes, all the amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals by species, they've got pretty decent population counts for the vertebrates. These populations have declined on average 58% over the last 40 years. And we see that for inverter, invertebrates too, in particular insects. It just, we don't have really good numbers for insects, but everybody knows about the windshield phenomenon. Back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you drove down the road all day, you'd have to stop and clean the bugs off your windshield. Pretty much, you don't have to do that anymore. Populations have, have nearly crashed for a lot of those, those kinds of insects. Another one of these amazing factoids is that Human activities now move more soil, rock, and sediment than is transported by all natural processes combined on the face of the earth. And the last one, which is the, of these three, the, the one that really just floored me was if we measure biomass, basically weight of, of all the mammals, of the, the class that we belong to, all the mammals on earth, humans are about 30% of the biomass, the weight of all the mammals on earth our domestic animals, mostly cows and pigs, are another 60%. All the wild mammals on the planet are about 4% of the biomass now. So there just isn't any doubt that we as humans have had this whole earth consequence 
And so the question at hand, you know, for tonight, for all of us and for the next few decades, I hope, is having had these consequences, do we have responsibilities? And if we have responsibilities, do we intend to be stewards? And if we intend to be stewards, what do we hope to accomplish? And that was the, the point of those two more sort of purposeful questions that we asked everybody that was gonna be on this Zoom, Zoom show tonight. And that is what is the single wisest action that homo sapiens, that we as a species could collectively do as stewards of the planet and then the very same question, except what is the wisest thing that we could each individually do as a steward of the planet? And we were hoping that uh, everybody would, would be thinking about that over the last week or two or three or four. And that uh, maybe at the end of this, we would, we would have people chiming in on the chat and we would discuss those, but there might be some other ways that we can do that. In any case, um, thanks for, Thanks for doing one more Zoom, and I'm going to Zoom off to Bruce, and he'll do his bit here. It's always challenging to follow Mark Osmond. You know, it gets it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark's second point there about how humans today move more dirt than all the natural processes on the globe is really a startling thing, and it really is the center point of what I'm going to talk about tonight. In my introduction, I said I was a forest hydrologist. I'm going to go into that a little bit more uh, and how that played out in terms of how I think about my interactions with the Anthropocene. So the, the, the questions, the aspects of these questions are, are big. I mean, there's a lot of things working to make these changes what they are today. We know things like climate change affects everything. In studying population dynamics, the ebb and flow of the number of people on Earth is probably the key to a lot of our ability to succeed in uh, sustaining things over any length of time. So the question about how we can be most responsible uh, as stewards of the Earth comes for me down to two topics that I'm going to talk about. One is the involvement of science in the design of on the ground activities. The second one is what I call writing the rules. And that's getting uh, input to policies and guidelines and laws. Pretty dry stuff. I'll move my hands a lot to make it exciting. <laughs> so one of the things going into, into all these discussions and what I learned years and years ago is the concept of the, of the range of natural variability. Uh, all the natural systems on earth fluctuate. We know that some years we have great floods, other years at periods of time we have droughts. Some years we have epic blooms of balsam root like we did this year and wildflowers are just outrageously everywhere in great form. Other years you wander around and you wonder where they are. So we understand that things are just generally never static, right? On, on top of that variability of all these processes and things that are, are moving along over time and going up and down, uh, and just to state the obvious, humans have had our way with these things. Uh, we've, we've made grand changes, some of which are irreversible. And we need to accept the fact as, as citizens and people trying to affect change is that we may never be able to get back to what we knew. Uh, things might, that, that horse has left the, the barn, so to speak. So on a, on a uh, specific note, I mentioned that I was, uh, excuse me, I gotta find my place. I was. I spent my career as a, as a forest hydrologist, right? And that means I spent a lot of time on the ground looking at proposed projects like timber sales, new road constructions, new campgrounds, ski areas, what have you. My job was basically to speak for water to the managers on national forest lands and to, to give it a voice. So I did that uh, in basically it, as a form of, I wrote management recommendations. I, I wrote things like how wide should the, the streamside buffer strip be to protect stream temperatures and eliminate sediment intrusion into the streams? 
I talked about how to build new ski area runs and trying to minimize erosion over time while still allowing the sport to grow as they wanted to do that. A lot of different kinds of uh, considerations. Most of that was done in my early career uh, as project level input. Later in my career, when I was a, a mid-level bureaucrat in the regional office, uh, I spent a lot of time undoing things that we'd done in the past. The whole agency, the Forest Service, uh, moved toward uh, a strong emphasis in ecological restoration, trying to undo things that had tweaked systems uh, that we wanted to bring back. Uh, things like relocating or obliterating roads that were disconnecting streams from their floodplains. Uh, thousands of culverts on national forest lands were undersized or, or in wrong places and eliminated any ability for fish to migrate upstream as they need to, particularly in the Northwest where salmon are a, are a really big deal. Uh, and the other example, of course, is it, not a course, but in, another example is the introduction of large woody debris back into stream systems where in the past we had pulled it all out uh, in the name of protection of down slope, downstream uh, resources and life. <clears throat> what we learned in, what, uh, in our attempts to do this ecological restoration, it's really technically and economically challenging to do something like that. And the second thing, it doesn't always work. You know? And so you have a lot of uh, failures, but learning opportunities, I would say. Uh, I mentioned that writing the rules for larger areas and time frames is, is a, an important opportunity. And that means to me, the stating of priorities, policies, and management guidelines, telling people, do this, don't do that. It's an extension of the project level management that I made in my early career, but it generally occurs at larger scales. And, and that's a good thing because these processes don't occur on, a, on, a, on an acre. They occur over grand areas. There's a cat. Um, <laughs> uh, so I spent a lot of time on individual forest plans on a couple of different forests, which are, are important aspects of management over time for those areas. We worked on regional priorities for areas within regions like the, the uh, Blue Mountain ecoregion of Northeast, Southeastern Washington, Northeast, Northeastern Oregon. And then the granddaddy of them all was the, the Northwest Forest Plan, which a lot of people think of as the spotted owl plan, but it considered, it broke management guidelines for uh, aquatic systems and processes that covered all the national forest BLM lands and other lands, federal lands, along the, along the entire length of the west side of the Cascades. And it overlapped into some of the, the areas like here in Wenatchee. So, that was a great opportunity to bring science to bear in terms of telling managers, do this, don't do that uh, on reasonably efficient scales for those kinds of considerations and over the time frames that are reasonable for those kinds of decisions. To, to wrap it up, I'm gonna go back to my two main points. One is that it's important to incorporate science into on the ground decision de design processes. And it's important to be participating in the writing of the rules. Here's a local example. Uh, we know Wenatchee is growing. You know, it's been recognized by a variety of Forbes magazine and other uh, periodicals, it's the place to be if you wanna retire. And so people are coming here like me. Uh, so we know it's growing and it's, uh, it's gonna to continue to do that. Well, the re the, that means more housing, be it for people that are affluent or people in low income situations. We're gonna have more people, we need to provide more housing. The easy ground's gone. 
uh, for developing stuff like this. And all that's really left are the hillsides and the steep slopes. So it's, it's the risky lands are what we've got. A couple of years ago, a proposal to develop land up around between Saddle Rock and Black Rock on, on the steep lands above there, uh, build, I think it was 19 houses on 10 acres or something like that. Uh, on land that's clearly classified by Chelan County as unstable and highly sus suspicious, uh, highly likely to fail and move downslope at great speed and hurt people and things downslope. Not a good place to build houses, roads, drainage ditches, sewer systems, and what have you. So a local group of citizens, of course, formed and, and started to contest this proposal. And it was uh, over a period of a couple of years, at great expense to the people contesting the proposal and a lot of cost to the, to the proponent because he had to keep going back and hiring consultants to help, uh, uh, help the city identify whether the proposal was uh, warranted or not. And so it, I asked myself today, did that succeed? Did we succeed in installing this operation? And the answer is, I guess, in, in the near term, yeah. yeah, I mean, the land, the, the guy threw, threw in the towel uh, and said, that's enough. And his land is now for sale. So in the long term, did we succeed? I don't know. That's jury still out in my mind. If another developer buys the land, we're back in the game again, I think. So it's, it's not, it's not always over when it's over. But coming out of that process at the public hearing, when the public hearings officer heard testimony from the citizens, one of the last things that he said was uh, really a good statement of my point about writing the rules. And his advice to the committee of people who were contesting this proposal was to work to influence the local planning ordinances and regulations rather than fighting the site-specific projects. Those are the things that bind his decisions and he has to go by what's written in the laws and regulations. So I think the effectiveness can be, it doesn't sound entertaining to me. It sounds long, bureaucratic and hard, um, but I think the effectiveness of being involved in rewriting the regulations is probably a much, uh, more efficient way to effect change. The last thing I want to talk about is there's a recent report, a 2020 report that the National Park Service prepared. It's, it's title, subtitle is, is Resist, Direct, and Accept. It's in the list of references that we were going to provide. I just want to read one sentence to you. It's, says the declining ability to undo or forestall human induced ecological change represents a substantial practical and philosophical challenge for managers accustomed to conserving natural systems and restoring impacted systems. To me, the key words in there are practical challenge. It might not be possible to come back to what we knew. And the philosophical challenge is, are we willing politically and institutionally to make these kinds of changes that we think are needed. And we're gonna get tested. And there are two things going on right now in Wenatchee that I think will uh, be a good case studies for us. The first is the Confluence Parkway proposal that the city has for the new uh, route along the north end of town to alleviate uh, the traffic congestion. And the other thing is the, the PUDs uh, efforts to restore the Haran natural area, which is anything but a natural area, but uh, it's, a, it's a vital social uh, community asset. And it has a lot of, a lot of the working pieces need to be reorganized, reconfigured and, and re retuned. So we'll see what we can do to effectively do that. Uh, and we'll see whether we're able to pull it off. We need to try. Well, and Bruce, you've done a lot um, in, in working on that Haran area. I really appreciate what you've done. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit differently. <laughs> Whether we call this time in that we live in the Anthropocene or something else, we are still collectively responsible for building a better world. 
We need to do what we can where we live and where we work or play using our particular interests and skills. And each one of us has different skills. We need to talk with others about climate change and act in our local community, like you were talking about, Bruce, in response to this crisis. We need to be the change. Does that sound familiar? It's attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. He said it in slightly different words. Talking with others may sound simplistic, but when we disagree on whatever the subject, such conversations are not simple. Listen to what others have to say, even and especially when they disagree with us. Find common ground and build on that. Climate scientist, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe tells us how to do this. All of Catherine Hayhoe's TED Talks and YouTube Talks are helpful. Her latest book is Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. It comes out in September of this year, and that's one I'll read. We certainly need that healing and hope. Nothing is simple, and no single climate solution will work alone or in every place. What can we do as a people, stewards of Earth, to hold the line in the climate crisis? Foundational in all policy decisions, like you were talking about, Bruce, um, must be that we put the greater good for people and the earth first. Not the increase of wealth, not power or control, not personal gain, and not growth at the expense of the natural world. We need to be wise, not just knowledgeable. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. The book Drawdown, which is in our resource list, gives many resources for climate solutions that are working right now in areas like transportation and food, energy, industry, health and education. Not one of these solutions can save our planet, but together there is hope. It's much easier to decide what I can do personally to alleviate the climate crisis. I have control over my actions. Let's look at food because we all eat. Food production produces a quarter of the Earth's greenhouse gas emissions. Experts on land use, climate change, and sustainable agriculture tell us that changing two habits can have a huge impact. Those two habits are one, stop wasting food, and two, eat less meat. We Americans waste nearly one third of our food and food is the single biggest component of our nation's landfills and that produces methane. And it's us at home, not the restaurants, not the schools or the corporations that are the dominant food wasters. We can change this. So don't throw out good food. Of course, you would not eat something with an off smell or visible mold, but expiration dates are confusing and often misinterpreted. There are 50 different kinds of use by type labels and only infant formula, only for infant formula are they federally regulated. Sell by is mostly just for inventory purposes. Best if used by and used by they deal with freshness and quality, not safety. Another thing, eat the food you buy. Americans who went through the Great Depression knew this. Serve appropriate portions, store food in suitable labeled containers and at the right temperature, prepare and freeze perishables instead of letting them hide in the refrigerator and go bad. Eat your leftovers. Sounds like your mother, huh? <laughs> Learn how to use small amounts of vegetables and meat. Those are the leftovers in creative ways. Think fried rice, extremely versatile. Soups, frittatas, and eat less meat, especially beef. Ruminants, cows, goats, sheep, buffalo, deer, elk, giraffes, and camels have four stomachs and chew their cud. They belch out methane in astounding amounts. And while we don't need to concern ourselves in this country so much with giraffes and camels, cows are responsible for about 10% of global emissions. And that methane 
is more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Eating less meat may range from meatless Monday to complete vegan or vegetarian diets. But there are many cultures that use meat in small amounts as an accent for their dishes, not the focus of the meal. This is more acceptable as a middle ground for many people. Some of you may remember the 1971 book, Diet for a Small Planet by Frances Moore Lape. Her recipes stress complementary proteins like grains and legumes, seeds and nuts, rice and beans. Lape is still active in her nonprofit, Real Democracy, that prioritizes policies for healthy farming and healthy food, engaging people in making democracy work better for more people. This year, she has her 20th book coming out. It's not too late. This is the name of it. It's not too late. Crisis, Opportunity, and the Power of Hope. That title is good advice for us today. It's not too late to rein in climate change, but make no mistake, this is a crisis and it's an opportunity for action. We have hope and hope is a powerful motivator. So Mark, what do you have to share with us? Oh, well, hard to follow that actually. So a couple of months ago, we decided to show this film, this Anthropocene film, and. I started doing some homework and it really became an expedition. And I've read quite a few books, fair number of books, and I did a lot of looking at websites and I've done a fair amount of looking at various papers and articles. And I found some really good introductions and guides out there and some divergent thinking. And so we put, just so everybody knows, we put it, not just mine, but an assortment of all these resources, the books, the website linkages and the article linkages, we put those on our website. So you can look at those and, and use that as a starting point if you would like. And the other thing that I, that I found when I was doing this expedition, this homework, was I came to realize how many people and how many organizations are out there that are thinking hard and doing really good things. And I actually ended up after a month and a half, couple of months of doing this with a lot more hope for the future than I, than I had when I started. And then lastly, I, I, learned, I learned a lot, but I learned how much that I still need to learn, which brought up for my age, this, this old dog and new tricks issue. But, you know, we can always learn, I hope, and I hope that's the case for, for me. So I mostly ended up thinking about the species level question that we've been asking people. And that is what's the single wisest thing we can do as homo sapiens, as a species, to, as a steward. And you know everything I read, probably the right answer to this question and the most pressing thing in our, in our future is simply reining in the carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gas emissions so that we can limit, hopefully, global warming to 2.0 degrees or even 1.5 degrees. That's going to be a huge, huge task for us to do that. There will be, it's gonna take massive economic, massive political, massive technological changes to pull that off. But the beauty of it is to do it, we're gonna to have to come together as a species. It won't work if we're in our separate countries glaring at each other and being suspicious, it won't work if we're doing all of our tribal stuff that we do so well, we're gonna to have to do it as a species. So if there's some, some golden part of this crisis that we find ourselves in, it may be that it forces us to think of ourselves as one species, as just people, just people at all. So um, if we don't make these goals, 1.5 to two degrees centigrade, things could get ugly. Um, some of the models suggest if we, if we don't do these massive things over the next decade or so, we could be looking at three degrees centigrade, four degrees centigrade. Some of the models even show five, six, seven degrees centigrade. At that point, we're in a world where we don't understand. Uh, it's quite likely um, that there will be some tipping point, some nonlinear interactions on the earth. And the effect of that will be that we could have whole biomes disappear. We could have the collapse, not the collapse, not the end of all humanity, 
but we could we could have the survival of human societies ending in various parts of the world. We don't want to go there. We really, it's not that, again, we would end up with the loss of all life on earth or all hu humans, but the world that would be left might not be, might be one that we really won't like. So I hope we don't go there. But I'm a biologist, not a climatologist and ecologist by training. So I've been thinking mostly about how biomes and ecosystems and species might fare in this, this world of climate change. And I keep coming back to that. I mean, when I was teaching, I was always using this quote. It's from Aldo Leopold, who was a wildlife biologist in the middle of the last century in the 1930s and died in the early 50s. And his quote is, to, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And this usually gets, it's widely quoted, but it usually gets paraphrased as the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. And what that means biologically is that the organisms are the cogs and the wheels and are the pieces. And what that matters in terms of climate change is 20, 30, 40 years from now, when we've had migrations of, of organisms northward, just trying to keep up with their, the place where they would normally live, they're moving northward, will almost certainly have lots of extinctions. We need parts and pieces, as many as we can. We never know when some insignificant seeming organism of the million named animals, some little copepod that is that you would hardly find if you went out and trawled in the Atlantic right now, may be the single critical link in food chains 40 years from now. The single critical link that keeps fishes going, that keeps whales going, we don't know. I mean, that happens all the time. It's happened in prehistory on Earth. We don't know which of those parts will be absolutely critical. So we have to get them into the future. And there's now a new planet-wide program for doing this. It's called the Half Earth Project. And it um, originated with the E.O. Wilson. Um, and the book is Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. But more importantly is the website for this, which is this massive website. And it's utterly the most important thing I think maybe we have on our list of resources on our website. So the, the scheme is that we would set aside half the earth, half the surface of the, the land surface of earth, half the surface of the oceans as a way, not, not without humans, but as intact as possible as a way of getting, buying tickets for organisms into the future, into the next few decades in the century. So it's good to figure out what this isn't. What it isn't is a plan to just instantly set aside huge tracts of earth and remove all the people like say, well, we need the Amazonia, the whole Amazonian basin, everybody has to leave and creating this giant half of a continent wide park out of it. Not, none of that at all. No interest in doing that whatsoever. And it also isn't starting from scratch. The idea is to incorporate all the existing chunks of land and sea that, that are already more or less protected. It doesn't mean without people, but it means that the ecosystems there are pretty much intact. So what do we have? We have parks, just think about the US. We have all of our national parks, we have state parks, we have refuges, we have reserves, all of those count. And they're in this website, they're being added in to this half of the earth. And so you end up with this clock that is slowly showing us getting closer and closer and closer to half the earth. And the beauty of this half earth proposal is not only do we use already existing places and then think about what else do we need to add and where can we find it, but it scales with size. So we have these, these things the size of Yellowstone at the top end, we have things the size of Haran, maybe somewhere in the middle, but at the lower end, we have your yard, your very yard. And that's the that's the other the other plan that I wanted to mention. And it's called Homegrown National Park. And it's a it's a something that an entomologist named Doug Ptolemy uh, proposed in his book just a year or two ago called Nature's Best Hope. And the idea is that just think about North America, Canada, US, we've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of suburban yards. And the idea is that at least all of these yards could be at least partially retrofitted with native plants. And the beauty of native plants 
is that they attract and provide food and habitat for native insects because they're co-evolved. So any given species of native tree is likely to have half a dozen, a dozen, couple of dozen insects that utilize that tree for food. And the importance of that is that these co-evolved insects are the major food source for lots of other organisms, most importantly, birds, most importantly, juvenile birds. They're utterly essential for feeding juvenile birds. So we've got the linkage, we've got the linkage for the Nature's Best Hope website on there. And just like the half earth, we've got a clock on that website that is spiraling up as people join their yard or whatever part of the yard they can into this homegrown national park. It is possible to do that. And so I was thinking, you know, Mary was talking about all the things that she could personally do. And so I was, as I mentioned, most of my thinking was about what we could do as a species, but for the personal thing, you know, the easy choice really probably is just buy an electric car. I mean, that would be a really important thing for lots of people to do. But my wife, my wife and I, we don't do much driving or travel in general. So my goal is to make my fairly large suburban yard part of the homegrown national park. So I am Dunsky. <laughs> So do we have now thousands of people that are now uh, wanting to chat with us there, Katie? Oh my gosh, I wish. My heart is broken, but- Oh no, don't, don't do that. No, 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 heart's broken. So you have this question <laughs> there, right at the very is, beginning. I do have questions myself though, um, just as, you know, a layman who doesn't have a science background, but did watch the documentary and was listening to you guys speak. I was curious. Um, well, one of my questions was, is there anything the average person can do to combat climate change or the climate crisis, which you guys answered excellently. I feel like I have tons of things that I can now do, which I wasn't expecting. Um, but I was curious. Um, so just from a term standpoint. They mentioned the Holocene, which is what we're technically still in. Well, what constitutes the Holocene? How is it measured? How is it decided upon? I don't really understand what that means either. And I was hoping that you guys could speak to it a little bit. I can do that. Does anybody else want to do it? Nope. <laughs> no. Um, the Holocene, is, it, it starts 10,700 years ago. And it's basically the end of the Pleistocene, the last glacial period, the last glacial period of the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene has been going for a couple million years. We've had all these glacials and then interglacial periods. And so the, the, the end of the last glacial period, basically when warming started was 10,700 years ago. And from that point on, it's called the Holocene. So and that, that happens to be just about roughly the time that, that peoples migrated across the Beringian land bridge into North America. So it's sort of a, a wave of peopling of the new, of what we think of as the new world. I didn't realize they were uh, so connected. Um, I was also curious, so a lot of animals here in the ecosystem that we all live in are going to be affected by these changes in the climate and the result of activity activity from the human race. <laughs> what what if would be some changes that might be observable in the day-to-day -day life, I guess, animals that you might interact with in your own neighborhood or in your own backyard. I think that sometimes when we talk about climate change, people think of it in terms of the ozone layer, the ozone hole in the Arctic and it, or perhaps deforestation in the Amazon and it feels very far away from where we all live. I was curious if you had any insight of some effects that we might see in Washington or North America in general, either in the animals or the land. Can, can I take a stab at that? Sure, sure. Uh, go for it. <laughs> you, you know, it's, 
personally, I, I find myself frequently getting overwhelmed with the news and articles about species in decline and, you know, we lost another five species overnight kind of a thing. It just kind of wears on me and great. Uh, and just this, the last few months, I've been involved in uh, discovering uh, Anna's hummingbirds in our area. And this is a bird, you know, they're, they're charismatic little creatures. They're here, uh, they're, they're expanding to the north. This was the first year during the Christmas bird count that they were uh, documented in Winthrop. Uh, so they, they, in the 1930s, they were all down south of San Francisco Bay Area and on the coastal area of California and down into Baja. In 1948, they reached the Oregon border. In 1974, they got to Seattle and they're here and they're resident all year round. Uh, and the reasons for that are, are primarily the fact that people are doing what Mark suggested and that's tailoring their backyards with native plants, things that are good for native species in general, but they're also feeding hummingbirds. Uh, and so between climate change and incorporation of native plants in artificial feeding, this little bird is expanding, it's doing well. And I got to watch two little tiny guys fly off from the nest for the first time, you know, this year, it's the first documented Anna's hummingbird nest in central Washington. So it's a, it's a big deal and I think it's worth celebrating. So Katie, are you talking about um, positive things or things that we can celebrate or things that are warning us? Well, I just, I think I phrased it as effects in general, though I do like this positive spin, I must say, because you're right, it can be very anxiety producing talking about climate change. You know, I was an environmental educator and taught third through fifth grade, and I had a hard time, <laughs> you know, teaching young children about it because it can be so depressing. But I guess to answer your question, just however, uh, any interesting facts that you've learned um, recently or however you'd like to answer that? Well, the first thing that came to my mind was the fire season. And that's not a positive thing. Um, and for various reasons, climate change being one of them, we have hotter and drier seasons here in Eastern Washington. Um, I read the newspaper and just Two days ago, there was a 250 acre fire up Swakane Canyon. And while it wasn't um, threatening people, it's a, it, it's a warning that this is coming. And it's easy for us to say, oh, the, it, it's, it's affecting people way over there. It's not affecting us, but it is. If we see that as um, a consequence of, of climate change, it is affecting us right now. And um, there, wherever you live, it's different. It might be sea level rise. Um, certainly in Miami, they're having, having to raise their, their buildings up because their high tides are coming in to inundate the buildings that were beautifully built along the, the seashore. Um, so we need to be aware that a lot of these things are warnings for us and um, the loss of species. I'm sorry, Bruce, but <laughs> I have to talk about that. The loss of species is like the canaries in the coal mine. It's warning us that that things are happening and we can't close our eyes or stick our head in the sand or anything like that. We have to do what we can do. And it doesn't mean despairing and um, giving up, but it means opening our eyes. Thanks, Mary. Sorry. No worries. No, that's great. Very well said. Um, we are at eight o'clock, you know, so I want to be respectful of y'all's time. But thank you so much for uh, joining this call and sharing some really insightful information and not just information, but also actionable items, too. I feel <laughs> I, I feel like learning the effects of 
native planting in backyards and learning how helpful that is. I don't know, it's inspiring and makes me hopeful. Um, would you guys like, or do, you, do we have any parting words before I end this call? <laughs> The list of, of resources that we've talked about is available on our website. I don't know if it'll be available through um, the museum also, but um, on the North Central Washington Audubon website. Oh yeah, and when we edit this video, we'll include a link there too. Okay, excellent. Great. Yeah, I just was checking in with Anna and we'll be doing a uh, taking the recording and sending it out to all who registered. We're not sure what happened there but we'll figure that out. And um, as we move forward with the film and lecture series as well, I, I really encourage anybody who is watching to keep following us and um, look forward to meeting you and welcome you back to the museum inside in person. And uh, really a big thank you to all of you for the care and dedication in all of your careers and um, and also with the Audubon to to make this possible and to shed light on this really important topic. <laughs> it affects us all. Yep. Yep. We're in it together. <laughs> we are in it together. That, yes. Yeah. Well, thank Everyone. you very much. Yeah, yep. Thank you. to you folks for hosting us. Of course, our pleasure. Have a good night. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.